We are rolling. This is Bernita Reed. It is November the 18th, 2017, and I'm here in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm here with Ronnie Stevens, and I would like to start with him introducing himself, saying when he was born and where he was born. Uh, my name is Ronnie Stevens, and I was born in San Antonio, Texas at Robert B. Green Hospital in 1956. Tell me your parents' names. Uh, my father's name was Joseph Felix Stevens, and my mother's name is Earlene Stevens. And what did they do for a living? Uh, my father, ex-military, and he ended up working for General Mills, and my mother, my mother, humble beginnings in Granger, Texas, she picked cotton and uh, she uh, bought her dress to go to college, Prayer View, by picking cotton. And she started at Prayer View and ended up uh, in the housekeeping field in San Antonio. And how far back can you go with your heritage? How far back? Uh, with my heritage, I would say that I can go back as far as Granger and what my grandmother and grandfather passed down to me. Tell me about that and their names. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Jesse Darden, uh, he's from Fayetteville, uh, Fayetteville County. And uh, that's in Texas, and my grandmother as well was from Texas. Uh, their story, my grandfather had a friend that needed a ride to go and uh, pick up a young lady for a date. The friend didn't have a car, so my grandfather had the car, and he offered to take the friend to see this young lady, which was my grandmother. Uh, the friend saw my grandmother, my grandfather took him away when he finished. He was supposed to see my grandmother again the following week. My grandfather uh, coincidentally didn't take the friend back that time. And that's how my grandmother, my grandfather, he was kind of crafty. But uh, yes, they, uh, my grandfather, he, uh, Married my grandmother, they had nine children, and uh, that's where the cotton came from. My grandfather had uh, mules, and he hired himself out and in Granger, Texas. Was uh, Do you know what year they got married? Uh, my oldest uncle that I can remember was born in 1920, so I would imagine they got married in 1919, somewhere thereabouts. And uh, he was he a sharecropper or uh, owned the land? He uh, eventually bought his land, and my grandmother, she bought her land from the children picking cotton, and, and, and at that time I had five, four aunts and four uncles, so they went off to serve in the war, and they would send their money back to my grandmother, and she bought five lots in Granger, which we still have to this day, yes. So they each bought land separately, your grandfather and your grandmother? Yes, 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 yes. My grandfather has two lots, my grandmother has five. That's I, interesting that they didn't purchase together. Is there something behind that? Yes, eventually uh, my grandmother and my grandfather separated and uh, my grandmother moved to uh, San Antonio, Texas, but my grandfather stayed in uh, Granger until he passed. Tell me where that land was. How would we pinpoint it? The land? Uh, in Granger, Texas, which I believe you know the story behind when Texas, the slaves realized that they were free. 
and it was General Granger that delivered the news. Granger, Texas has a lot of, uh, had a lot of Bohemian people, I understood, uh, and they more or less treated the African American people as, as like themselves because both of them were considered foreigners. And I also heard my grandmother say it was great clan's presence in Granger as well. And uh, they hired themselves out for work. And the land is up on the hill. It's uh, uh, very, it's black land. They call it black land, the dirt. And uh, uh, it was good for growing cotton. And uh, it's still there. It's, 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 they raise corn, cotton, and Granger to this day. And your family is held on to that land. It was homesteaded, and my grandmother uh, and my grandfather, they wanted it to be passed down from generation to generation and not be sold. And uh, uh, that we have done through the years. Uh, did you hear stories about slave times in Granger? That I did, that I did. Uh, well, uh, I, I had, I've heard lots of stories. My, my grandmother, she was, uh, her heritage came, I guess, Blackfoot Indian. And uh, she would share that she had high cheekbones. And uh, a lot of, uh, back then, a lot of families, they grew up on the same plantation. They worked on the same plantation. And believe it or not, it was a lot of people that were related down the line and didn't know it. I had a relative that uh, used to joke. I really didn't find it that funny. But he said after 630, nobody was related. But uh Yes, they explained about slavery and how they used to pick cotton for 50 cents a day. And my grandmother having the kids, uh, uh, she was quite creative. They, I heard stories that she had the first inside bathroom because they had outhouses. Uh, she had cabinets and stoves and what have you. She was quite creative. But yes, they passed those stories down. And the inside bathroom was at the homestead? Yes, yes. And uh, you say it was on a hill? Yeah. Uh, they had a, 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 the black people in the town went to a uh, school at the lower end of town, which was called Crispus Attics, and they had uh, a black school and a white school, ironically. And uh, the, my grandmother had the property on a hill uh, near the white school. And uh, eventually uh, they were able to integrate. There was a football player that came from Granger, my wife, <clears throat> Excuse me, her father, uh, his name was, uh, they called him Shaq, but he was Charlie Warner. He went to Prairie View and he played professionally for the Buffalo Bills. But back then, he couldn't go to that white school. He passed in 2010, and ironically, it was chosen by the family to have his home going in the gymnasium of that white school. Yes. And you said there was a lot of Klan activity. What happened that you remember? Uh, they uh, basically, they had white police officers for the Caucasians and they had a black police officer for the African Americans and the black police officer was not able to arrest white people, but he could uh, 
he could uh, arrest black people. And uh, I've heard stories of, of, of how certain women dated the white police officers and those women were off limits to other black men, all kinds of stories. Uh, but uh, also I heard that my grandfather and some other men, they had a problem with uh, Caucasian and they stood their ground. Uh, as I said, they picked a lot of cotton and a lot of the young men went to service from there and they were able to go to Spain and see that there wasn't the same prejudice in other parts of the country. And I had an uncle that told a story that they had a tree where everybody would come and play dominoes up under this particular tree in town. These young men had picked cotton before they left and they went off to service in Spain and in Germany and they worked on the Red Ball Express, which took fuel and food ammunition to the enemy lines. But my uncle, after they got out of service, they came back to Granger and they had a couple of dollars and they were playing dominoes. And there was a white man that drove up and he said, I need a couple of you, you, you boys to come and uh, pick some cotton for me. And, uh, my uncle having gone to Spain, he was a character and he said, of course, I will pick your cotton if you go and get it and come bring it up under this tree. And uh, the story was the man turned kind of red and drove off on two wheels, but uh, they had lots of stories, lots of stories. Do you have any other favorite stories of that? Uh, none except, uh, my grandmother uh, was very adamant about saying no thank you. Uh, I remember one time me, myself and my cousins went to one of her church members, one of their house and we wanted some water. So the lady told us to go to the refrigerator and get some water. We opened the refrigerator and it was the, the reddest watermelon I ever saw in my life. We were just staring at it, drooling. So the lady said, would you guys like some watermelon? And naturally we accepted and we ate the watermelon. It was good. But when we got home, my grandmother whooped all of us for accepting the watermelon. And we didn't understand why. And afterwards she sit us down and she said, learn how to say no thank you. Uh, you make people think that I'm not feeding you if you accept. It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, well, needless to say, the next time we went over to the lady's house, she thought it strange that she offered some kids some cookies. And we all said, no, thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> And tell me about your education. Where did you go to school? I went to school. I started at, uh, well, I started in Granger because uh, I stayed with my grandfather for a while. But I went to CUNY Elementary in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I had an aunt. Actually, it began in, in Seattle, Washington. My aunt was a school teacher. And she would sit me in a corner with a pencil and a piece of paper. And she would give me a letter that was wrote in cursive. And I can remember the day that I would draw the curly cues because that was cursive lettering. But what it led to at three years, at, at, at five years old, I could write my name in cursive. And they discovered that I was drawing the letters. So I drew all through elementary. I, I drew things that we were financially challenged and I drew things that I didn't have. And I would draw on paper, brown paper bags with a number two pencil. And I had an unlimited supply of art paper. But I went to CUNY, I graduated from Brackenridge High and I went to school in Los Angeles. And I went to El Camino, Otis Art Institute, the American Animation Institute. And I moved, 
I was in California. I had an opportunity to finally paint in Beverly Hills. And I was presented with the question of moving back to San Antonio to take care of my mother and some uncles that were getting up in age. And uh, I was at the crossroads to, to paint in Beverly Hills uh, and or come back to Texas and take care of my mother and my uncle. And I poised the dilemma to a gentleman that I met on the street and he said, well, I'll tell you this. I was faced with that dilemma once in my life to stay here and work in California. I'll go home and take care of my mother. By the time I made my mind up, I was 30 days too late. So that immediately made my mind up to move back to Texas. And I've been blessed to do everything that I thought I could have did in Beverly Hills and more. What years were these that you were going to school in Los Angeles? From 1974 to 1999. I continuously took classes. Uh, I feel that you can never learn too much. Doctors have to continually take classes because new things are, are, are discovered every day, as with anything we do. And what were those opportunities that you turned down in Los Angeles? Uh, I joined an art group. It's called Studio 108. In, in, in the Wilshire District, which is Lower Beverly Hills. And uh, I took a life drawing class there. And the owner, which was a Jewish lady, one day she told me that they only accept 12% of the applicants to join this group and they paint in Beverly Hills and they sell lots of work. And she grabbed my hand and she looked me in the eye and she said, it would behoove you to apply. And I said, okay, she said, no, it would behoove you to apply. In other words, I would be a shoe in. And uh, I had to think real hard, but after the gentleman shared that story with me, it wasn't necessary again. Do you remember her name? No, I don't remember her name, but I remember the look in her eyes when she told me it would behoove me to submit an application. And what year did you come back to San Antonio? I moved back in August of 1999. And what, what happened when you got back? When I moved back, uh, coming from Los Angeles, I in Los Angeles, they had an African marketplace, which I go to attend every February at the Pan-African Film Festival. And it's just what it says. It's an African-American marketplace where a group of black people come together with their talents and they, they share in this marketplace. It's for us. It's about us. You might find a uh, somebody that paints on mud cloth. You might find somebody that makes dolls out of uh, black eyed peas and, and, and quilting material. Uh, and and it's, we share with each other. And when I came back to San Antonio, I wanted to know where the black artists or where was the African marketplace here in San Antonio. There was none and I was I felt bad, real bad, but I discovered that there was a African-American art group, the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society. And uh, I joined them. That was started by John Coleman and uh, Aronetta Pierce, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I've been a member since uh, 2000. Yes, ma'am. Where do you think your artistic ability comes from? Even though I've, take, I've, I've taken classes at various institutes, it's God-given. To be able to draw letters at three years old, uh, to, to hold a pencil without poking your eye out or eating it, that's God-given. 
that's what I believe. Uh, for example, if you're a bullfrog and you want to sing, you go and you take singing lessons, you'll be a bullfrog that can carry a note, but you're still going to sound like a bullfrog. <laughs> it's God-given, and I don't take it for granted. So tell me the migration that you had in your artwork. What did you start doing? You did letters. What did you, at what point were you doing different things? Uh, as I said, I was financially challenged, so uh, I didn't have much money. Back then, lunch, the CUNY, uh, uh, 30 cent, 25 cent for lunch, that came with milk, and the extra five cents, you could get dessert. Uh, I didn't have 25, 30 cents a day. Uh, my mother cleaned other people's houses. So what I would do, uh, superheroes, Batman, Thor, uh, Captain America, uh, I had classmates that loved these comic book heroes. So I would draw the comic book heroes for them, for their lunch money. And in doing so, there was a Carver Library I, my favorite superhero was Star, so I read that it was, uh, he was from Greek mythology. So I went to the Carver Library on Hackberry then with some cut off pants, barefoot, and the lady allowed me to come in. I wanted a book on Greek mythology. She gave me a book on Greek mythology, The Cat in the Hat, Curious George, and the writings of Langston Hughes. She put that under the bottom of the stack and I took that home and I realized I remember the Greek mythology and all of this other stuff, but Langston Hughes, I didn't remember, but I was drawn to a poem, A Mother to a Son by Langston Hughes. And I put that on my mother's obituary because of that experience. Yes, ma'am. What did that inspire you to draw? Uh, I wanted to draw. In school, I would draw nice, neat hair of Caucasians. But as I grew and went to school in California, my uncle would push me to draw nappy hair. He said, nobody's hair. I would draw afros nice and neat and in place. He said, that's a nice, neat afro, but a real afro doesn't look like that. Draw me some nappy hair. And he would push me to draw realistically. So I began to follow Charles White, which uh, was a well-known artist uh, back in the 70s. and. I was inspired by him. So that led to me drawing our own personal situations. And uh, what about Langston Hughes has influenced you later? I began to study the Harlem Renaissance movement with uh, what well, we just had, Zora Neale Hurston and uh, 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 Thurgood Marshall, I, I, this little clique that they had, this positive clique that they had, and I wanted to know what distinguished them from the South. And uh, uh, the writings of, of that he did, it just uh, would paint a picture with words. And I myself wanted to paint an experience with pencil and paint. Can you tell me about that experience of, of picture, of drawing words in a picture form? How does that happen? Well, <clears throat> it, excuse me, it, it, it begins with an idea like, for example, I did a picture uh, that was on display at Prairie View. And uh, I, I do a lot of entertainers, you know, like Ray Charles and what have you. But I also wanted to do a picture, do P 
pictures like I paint the picture of the cotton, which I've shown you. I, I actually picked the cotton from the side of the road with the intent of painting the picture and gluing the cotton onto the picture. As I picked the cotton that blew to the side of the road, I had a plastic bag and I was leaning down, pick, putting the cotton in the bag and people were riding by looking at me. It was a very humbling experience. I was doing it because I wanted to, but when they did it, they were doing it because they had to. Or that was how they would feed their family. The picture that I did at Prairie View, uh, I noticed I was somewhere at one time and I noticed that the white people didn't, weren't particular about the black people. The Mexicans weren't particular about the black people. The Orientals weren't particular about the black people. And on top of all of that, some black people had the nerve to not like other black people. So I wanted to paint that mentality. So I had to do the research. And I began with the Willie Lynch letter. And you, if you're familiar with that, uh, this was in 1712 that I painted this picture. And it starts with the making of a slave. And I have the hands at the top, which is the the Caucasian. The picture is red, white, and blue because we have a lot of gang activity. And I have the string in the middle and he has the, the slave that works in the house turning his back against the one that works in the field. The bright skin one against the dark skin one. And what that does, I have a picture of uh, black men incarcerated. I have black men in caskets and a black woman crying. The separation of the, the black family. And at the bottom of the picture, I have the two colors, red and blue, with their shaking hands and the colors are entwined. So at the beginning is the problem and at the bottom is the solution. That's painting uh, a vision. It's powerful. Um, if I can get myself together again. <laughs> um, but um, tell me about your involvement in the community in San Antonio and, and the artistic community. Uh, I, I'm a member of the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society and we give scholarships. When I was coming up, I had teachers that would take whoever could draw well, they would have us paint the uh, different principles in other pictures. We would go to McCreary's Mall and paint the, the, the Christmas scene and what have you. But I knew no African-American artists from my community, so uh, being a member of the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society, we would give paid young African Americans, pay their tuition to Southwest School of the Arts and what have you. And one day uh, we were discussing it and we had the idea that we have artists in this group. Why can't we share what we know with the students? And they had me uh, put my money where my mouth was. So I was able to teach. Um, I, I, I was one of the first artists in the group to teach our own students as opposed to sending them to the Southwest School of the Arts. So uh, uh, I was able to share what I wanted to know when I was young. And it's a beautiful thing to, to, to see a young child with their love of anything. And it's, it's in your field to share what you know and watch them blossom. It's, it's a beautiful sight. Yes. Tell me about some of the artists that you want to also talk about in uh, the artist community of San Antonio. In San Antonio, we have uh, 
uh, in our group we have it's the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society, so naturally we have African American artists, but ethnic is inclusive of other ethnicities. So we have Caucasians that are jewelry makers, uh, but we have sculptors, we have uh, wood craftsmen. Paul Heard, he does, uh, he is a sculptor. Gracie Paul is a sculptor. Uh, Howard Roder, which he's a a graduate of uh, and on the board of Southwest School of Art. He paints African Americans in oil. We have uh, John Coleman that uh, I had the, I was blessed to display in the African American Art Museum in Dallas with him. Uh, he paints oils uh, and he painted with Doc Spellman which is a local artist from San Antonio. But uh, we have uh, lots of uh, 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 local talent that uh, might otherwise be uh, uh, unheard of. And, and, and also Tony Edwards uh, and Lila Kaku. She, ironically, the former mayor of San Antonio, she's collected art from all of these individuals and she has it on display, donated it to St. Philip's College as a permanent installation. So one can go to St. Philip's and see the art of local artists, uh, uh, artists past and present there at St. Philip's College. How do you hope the art world to influence the SACAM um, effort that's being put forward? Uh, well, I, I, uh, anybody here from San Antonio, when their relatives come, do you take them to the river walk? Okay, if you ride that boat on the river walk, you get to a certain point, and it's the history of Texas up on the wall. They show the Spanish influence, they show the Indian influence, which I guess lead, they have Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone, somebody up there, which led to the Mexican-American, but my, as I told you before, my grandfather, my grandmother, they picked cotton. Uh, they don't have to have nobody up there picking cotton, but were, were there any black people, even at the Alamo? What about that yellow rose in Texas? Wasn't that a black woman? There's no depiction of us. And my family, they don't like to ride the boat me because I get kind of loud about it and they'd be glad when we return to the, to the, you know, get off the boat. But uh, I feel that just as everybody else, uh, uh, their history is shared in San Antonio. We need representation. Who tells our story? We have that that I know that one statue of Martin Luther King that uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about the, the statue, but uh, uh, where is it the Buffalo, the Buffalo soldiers, that, that beautiful installation that we have over there, but, but, but the Davis Scott YMCA, Mr. Davis, I remember uh, being part of the YMCA when Mr. Davis was alive. And, you know, when we would go on swimming trips, guess where we would go? To a real quick creek, not a swimming pool, a creek. But uh, we have no representation of, of our history. And uh, it's quite important because after us, who shares with the young ones behind us? How, how does our legacy continue. Is there a story or anything that I haven't asked that you would like to tell about? A story that I would like to tell about. Uh, only the fact that uh, I uh, uh, I went to CUNY Elementary, and I remember uh, there was a teacher, Miss Sadbury, 
uh, uh, she was a fourth grade teacher and she would encourage us in the arts, Miss Stevens. Uh, it's now Friendship uh, Baptist Church, but it's actually CUNY Elementary, which uh, was uh, in, the, in the heart of the Denver Heights. And I heard the story from Miss Williams, uh, uh, Geraldine Williams, which wrote a book about CUNY and, and, and the other Brackenridge, which is the school across the street from where the original Carver Library was. The, it was called the Colored School or uh, something of, of that nature. But uh, she shared with me that the Denver Heights was uh, uh, created because, you know, you have Alamo Heights, right? All of the black people that work for the people in Alamo Heights, they lived in Denver Heights because it was close to their jobs. So uh, I, uh, I just think that we have a story to be told and it needs to be shared. Just think of the three projects, the Victoria Courts, the Sutton Homes, the, the Wheatley Courts, they, they're all torn down with these elaborate villages now, but uh, there's a history that needs to be shared. The Phyllis Wheatley High School, all, all I mean, it's, 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 it's disappearing. And, and we even Cape Radio, uh, we need we need something. Uh, that's the story I'd like to see. Thank you so much for this. I I guess I didn't ask about your wife and if you have children. Uh, <clears throat> I my wife my wife we went to. Uh, Brackenridge High School together. Uh, my wife, she uh, became a nurse for 25 plus years at the VA. Ironically, she dropped out of school, but she, and she was from Granger. Her people were from Granger. Her father was Charles Warner to play for the Buffalo Bills. We didn't know that we had roots in Granger uh, at the time, I had relatives that used to joke that we might be kissing cousins. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. What's her name? My wife, her name uh, was Alfreda Warner Stevens. She was a nurse at the VA for 25 plus years, but she passed from breast cancer uh, in 2016. And being a nurse, uh, that was an experience within itself, but uh, she is my hero, and our family that we have together. She left me uh, in charge, but she taught me a very important lesson about life and relationships in general. It's not so important as to be right as it is to do us right. You have children? Uh, yes, I have children. I have, uh, I'm raising two grandchildren that Mr. Will uh, uh, has taught, shared this wonderful gift that he has with uh, sight and sound and they're both attending college now. And uh, they are from my oldest daughter that passed from lupus. I, I hate to, to, to keep dwelling on death, death, but it's part of life, it's part of life. Tell me your children's names and your grandchildren. My grandchildren, uh, my daughter's name was Takesha Monique McCaskill. My grandson, his name is Deontay McCaskill and my granddaughter is Ibriya. McCaskill. My granddaughter is attending St. Philip's, going into the nursing program. My grandson is at Uvalde, at Southwest College in Uvalde. And because of Mr. Will's influence, he's taking business. And I appreciate all that Mr. Will 
shared with him, but uh, yeah, they they are becoming outstanding citizens. Thank you for this time. Thank you for having me. We're, we're taking turns getting, <laughs> getting yeah. emotional. Um, <laughs> okay. You got me. Okay. I got, I got, you got me <laughs> on the first one, so. I don't know. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you for watching. Um, okay, and we are. Okay, hey, I'm back with Ronnie Stevens, and I wanted him to tell a little bit more about his artwork and where it is placed. Uh, what I failed to mention earlier was uh, the way that I found the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society. I took my mother to Dr. Leo Edwards' office, and there was African-American art in there, and he shared with me that the group would be meeting there as he would give them an opportunity to display work every month. And uh, he invited me to a Christmas party at his house once, and I really wasn't interested in the party, but his house up the staircase, it was like a, a, a museum. Uh, uh, oh my God, but uh, him encouraging and uh, sharing. I met his brother, Anthony Edwards, which is an extraordinary artist, and uh, his uh, sister, Michelle, and then I met Wayman with the newspaper, and there is a close-knit, uh, but through Dealing with them, I've been fortunate to display in the lower rotunda of the state capitol in Austin. Uh, I've done the Jazz Alive uh, poster 2012, uh, uh, the Parks Foundation. Uh, currently with the San Antonio Ethnic Art Society, which we will uh, be displaying. We are displaying now in the East Austin Studio Tours. We have an event coming up on uh, Monday, uh, which is posted on their website. Uh, we're displaying in Austin, December the 2nd. And I currently paint local jazz musicians, local and world-renowned, like Billy Ray Shepard. He plays at churches around San Antonio, but I painted him uh, several weeks ago at the Big Bibbs Event Center. So I've painted local, uh, I mean, renowned jazz musicians like Jeff Larber, Hiroshima, uh, people that I only would listen at their music before. But uh, San Antonio has been a blessing to me. I can't complain. What are the formats of your work? Oh, I am a pastel. If I had to do a picture in my life depending on it, I would use pastel. I am a pastel artist. Uh, and I wanted to learn how to do my work from start to finish. That's the creation, the matting and framing, the reproduction of G clay prints and how do you properly sign and number to to go and get a DBA and tax ID? I wanted to know everything from a blank piece of paper to the finished product. And uh, I've been blessed to find that out. Thank you.